Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm really excited to be talking to you about this topic today because I think the decision between using a primary or a secondary antibody conjugate is sometimes uh, taken, taken uh, lightly. However, if considered carefully, it can have a, a great impact on your results. So I hope you find it interesting and relevant to your, to your work. And as uh, Jessica just mentioned, mentioned, at the end, uh, we will have a Q&A session in which I will answer your questions as best as I can. So I'm just going to go ahead and um, first walk you a little bit through uh, the webinar uh, to, uh, today. So uh, first, I'm going to start uh, by uh, talking a little bit about the differences between direct versus indirect methods, in, uh, and, and I'm also going to uh, talk about the relevance to uh, applications such as solar imaging and flow cytometry. But of course, as, as, as we will see later, they also apply to other immunoassays such as uh, and ELISA and Western blood, of course. And, and, and then we will move on and start uh, with the benefits and limitations of using either a primary or a secondary antibody, antibody conjugate. I, I, they relate to the use of either a direct or indirect method. After that, we will also talk about the relevance of these benefits and limitations I may, I'm going to talk about to multicore analysis. I know that many of you are starting uh, to perform uh, multicore experiments. The popularity of, of uh, using multiple labels in your immunoassays is increasing in popularity, so I thought it would be uh, very good to actually introduce this uh, topic in the webinar as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and start with uh, the difference between direct versus indirect methods. As, as you may already know, uh, direct methods are the ones that use a conjugated primary antibody. So as you can see here in the diagram, in the diagram, in a direct method, we have the antigen of, of, of interest in red color. And then we have our primary antibody detecting, detecting the antigen of interest. And if the primary antibody it is already conjugated to a fluorophore or, or an enzyme or, or a protein. So it's actually the primary antibody providing the signal for you to be able to detect uh, the localization or, or, or the, the expression of your antigen of interest. However, in indirect methods, two different antibodies are used. We still are going to need the primary antibody, which is going, of course, to detect uh, your antigen, antigen of, in, of interest, but then We'll use a secondary antibody against the primary antibody, and it's the secondary antibody which is actually uh, conjugated to the fluorophore or the molecule that you're going to be able, that you're going to use uh, as a reporter in your immunoassay. And as you, as you can already see by this diagram, there, there are some obvious differences between the two methods, or, or what is the same between using a direct, direct antibody conjugate versus an indirect uh, an, an indirect method or, or a secondary antibody conjugate. And of course, uh, these direct and indirect methods, they apply to most immunoassays, as I was just mentioning earlier, including immunocytochemistry or cellular imaging, immunohistochemistry, flow cytometry, and ELISA. And I, and I will talk a little bit more about spe specifically cellular imaging and flow cytometry, as I know that the popularity of these technologies is is increasing considerably. Uh, is increasing considerably nowadays. So, moving on onto the benefits and limitations of either one of these products, the first one of of this uh, benefit or limitation, depending on how you look at it, is actually and obviously time. So. Of course, uh, um, and, 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 you, and, and this is quite obvious, uh, a direct method or using a primary antibody conjugate results in a shorter protocol. And the reason for that is because less incubation steps are required during the protocol. So basically, you have your sample, let's say, an, 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 a tissue slide in an immunohistochemistry experiment. You incubate with your primary antibody uh, conjugated to HRP, let's say, and then after the incubation with the primary antibody, you are already, you're, you can already use, uh, you can already that, take that tissue uh, slide uh, to the microscope to be visualized and analyzed because it's actually the primary antibody that is going to provide that signal after uh, using your detection reagent. However, 
if, if using an indirect method or, or what is the same as secondary antibody conjugate, of course the protocol will be longer. Two incubation steps are needed. First, your sample is incubated with the primary antibody, but because this one is unconjugated, the sample requires a second, a second incubation with the secondary antibody uh, conjugated to your uh, molecule of interest to users or reporter. And then at this stage is when you're able to visualize uh, your antigen of interest. So the use of secondary antibody conjugates results in additional steps in your protocol. So this is the first of the factors to consider when, between, when deciding between either method. But of course, there are other factors as well. The second one of them is cost. Generally, direct, uh, sorry, uh, primary antibody conjugates are generally more expensive. Not only more expensive than secondary antibodies, but obviously more expensive than unconjugated primary antibodies. The reason being is that, um, of course, the primary antibody conjugate needs need to be conjugated, and that adds uh, cost to its uh, production. However, uh, secondary antibodies are relatively inexpensive compared not only, of course, to primary conjugates, but uh, but also primary unconjugated antibodies, and and that of course that also adds additional uh, cost saving. Uh, to your experiment because you actually have also the possibility of using the same secondary antibody to detect uh, several different primary antibodies. As, as, as we will see uh, later, we are also going to be talking about that because it, it also affects the flexibility of, of, of your assay. So just, just very briefly, generally, uh, more expensive primary antibody conjugates Secondary antibodies are relatively inexpensive, inexpensive, and you can use them um, to detect several primary antibodies. Another factor to consider, of course, is the complexity. And what I mean by complexity is actually uh, the difficulty of designing the experiment. And why is that? Because uh, usually, Indirect methods result in more complex experiments. They, they usually require more controls as, as you are having more reagents in your experiment. So, uh, for instance, uh, of course, if, if you're going to have the secondary antibody, you're going to need a control with only the secondary antibody just uh, to make sure that the secondary antibody is not uh, giving you any background or, or false positive signal. And, and depending on the technique, there are also other controls that need to be included. However, um, if using a primary antibody conjugate, uh, it actually simplifies the, the, the experiment quite, quite a bit because uh, it's already, the primary antibody is already conjugated and there's so, not so many controls that are required. And these, of course, uh, these um, factors are actually uh, heightened when doing multicolor experiments. In multicolor experiments, the controls needed in indirect methods are, are are many more than for direct methods, and of course you also need to account for species cross-activity. And we're also going to talk a little bit about this uh, later, uh, more in detail. But just, just at the moment, it's, it's, we, can, we can generally say that indirect methods are more complex, while direct methods are less complex. So as I was mentioning earlier, uh, another factor to consider, to consider when deciding between direct methods and indirect methods, or what is the same between using a primary antibody conjugate or a secondary antibody conjugate, is flexibility. Um, and of course, uh, direct methods or primary antibody conjugates uh, result in less flexibility. Why is that? Because let's, for instance, consider this example here. We have our three primary antibodies one against ACT4, another one against SOX2, and another one against NANOC. It seems obvious that uh, in this case it's an experiment uh, for stem cells. And of course, uh, because we're using primary antibody conjugates, our antibody conjugated, uh, our antibody, primary antibody against ACT4 is already conjugated to green fluorophore. Our antibody against SOX2 a red fluorophore, and then the one for NANOC is conjugated to a blue fluorophore. If, if by any uh, chance we wanted uh, to get out of this combination. This combination as it is, as it is works very well. The three colors are, are quite far away from each other in regards to their spectral overlap. So it's a nice combination for a multicolor experiment. But if we wanted, for instance, combine our antibody against NANOC 
with an antibody against actin, let's just say, and by any chance that antibody against actin was also contributed to a blue fluorophore, we wouldn't be able to use the two of them in the same experiment, but of course, because they would be both contributed to blue fluorophores. And, and that's how uh, using a primary antibody conjugates limits a little bit your flexibility in the experiment. However, secondary antibody conjugates because you can use the same secondary antibody to detect several different primary antibodies that adds uh, great flexibility to your experiment. In this case, for instance, we have our unconjugated antibodies, primary antibodies against OC4, SOX2, or NANOC, and we have secondary antibodies. Uh, one secondary antibody is labeled to green, and, and we make it uh, to detect OC4, but then we may have another uh, secondary, and, but we may also use it to detect NANOC. Of course, you will need to consider the, the species in which the primary antibody has been raised. But because usually uh, many different antibodies are used in a lab, you can actually have just a few secondary antibodies that uh, may be used for hundreds of different uh, primary antibodies. So uh, using secondary antibodies adds that flexibility to your experiment. Moving on. Sensitivity, um, and, and this is, is obviously reflected in the diagram, as, as I was mentioning earlier. Direct antibody conjugates, uh, or sorry, primary antibody conjugates usually uh, provide a lower sensitivity, and the reason being is because if your primary antibody already conjugated, so you, have, uh, you, don't, you don't have the signal amplification provided by the secondary antibody. When using secondary antibodies, several secondary antibodies will bind to the same primary antibody, resulting in an amplified signal that is not provided by primary antibody conjugates. So generally, primary antibody conjugates will result in a lower sensitivity than uh, using secondary antibody conjugates or than using an indirect method. So what about species cross-reactivity? So species cross-reactivity is an issue to consider when using uh, secondary antibody conjugates. So if you're using a primary antibody conjugate, the species cross-reactivity is minimized. Your primary antibody, let's, let's consider this example here. We have our antigen A and our antigen B in, in uh, red and yellow, respectively. And we have our primary antibodies against antigen A and antigen, antigen B already conjugated. So because we are using a primary antibody that is already conjugated, the possibility for these antibodies to cross-react with other antigens we are interested in is actually minimal, even more if you are using monoclonal antibodies, of course. However, in indirect methods that uh, they require the use of secondary antibody conjugates, there is a potential species cross-reactivity uh, of, the, of the secondary antibody with another uh, primary antibodies raised in different species. So let's just consider this example here, for instance. Again, we have our antigen A, antigen B, and our primary antibodies A and B. Now let's consider that the primary antibody to, for detection of antigen A has been raised in mouse, and the primary antibody for detection of antigen B has been raised in rat. Because of the high homology between mouse and rat, when we incubate our uh, sample with secondary antibodies against, um, against mouse, because of that high homology, is likely that the secondary antibody will cross-react also with the primary antibody raised in rat. Here, the secondary antibody against mouse is this one in blue with the green fluorophore, and you, and you can see that one of them is cross-reacting with the primary antibody raised in rat. And the same with the, the secondary antibody raised against rat. In this case, you can, you can see it in, in, in gray, conjugated to a, another fluorophore, and then the primary antibody uh, against rat is, of course, detecting the primary, the primary antibody raised in rat, but it may also cross-react with the primary antibody raised in mouse. So there is a potential species cross-reactivity that you need to account for when using secondary antibodies. However, I also want to mention that if you still need to use secondary antibodies in your experiment, you also have the possibility of using pre-absorbed secondary, antibody, secondary antibodies. If you're not familiar with pre-absorption of secondary antibodies, basically this is when we get a secondary antibody 
um, against, for instance, RAD, and, and we want to uh, remove all those secondaries that may potentially cross-react with mouse. So we get the antibody solution, the secondary antibody solution, and we pass it through a, a column containing serum proteins uh, from, from mouse. And of course, when, pa when passing through the secondary antibody solution, uh, when passing it through this column, those antibodies that may potentially cross-react with mouse, they will stick to the serum proteins from mouse containing the column, and only those antibodies that are highly specific uh, to detect rat will flow through. You will end up with a highly specific secondary antibody. So if you still need to use a secondary antibody for uh, your experiment and you're worried about potential cross-reactivity, you should uh, consider uh, using pre source secondaries. Similarly, another, uh, another and the last uh, factor to consider uh, um, in, in, in choosing between direct or an indirect methods is, of course, background. And, and similarly to species cross-reactivity background, as, as you have probably already guessed, with direct, or, or with direct methods or primary antibody conjugates, the background is reduced. And, and like, like before, you're using a primary antibody which is already conjugated, so the, the, the potential of this primary antibody cross-reacting with other antigens on the tissue and that, and that may provide, uh, bring that, that background is, is again, uh, minimal. However, if you're using secondary antibodies, this, because you're just adding additional reagents to your, um, to your experiment, these secondary antibodies may uh, cross-react with other antigens in your tissue and, in your tissue and bring uh, up that background. Even, and, and this is especially true and, and a very important to, factor to consider in tissues that are highly abundant in uh, FC receptors. FC receptors are uh, receptors that they interact with the constant region of the, uh, of the, of the antibody, and because these, these tissues that are highly abundant in these FC receptors, they will interact with, of course, the antibodies that we are trying to use for detection of our um, antigen of interest. If you still need to use an indirect method or a secondary antibody conjugate in your experiment, and you're worried about potential background or, or the interaction of secondary antibodies with FC receptors, you could also uh, use fragment antibodies. And if you're not familiar with fragment antibodies, let me just very briefly go through it. So fragment antibodies, what they are basically is, is as the name implies, is a fragment of the primary of, or, of an antibody. So how we generate the fragment antibodies is by enzymatic digestion. So two different enzymes are just normally used, uh, pepsin and papain. I believe, if I remember correctly, is papain, papain which cuts here, if you can see my pointer. And, and the papain, of course, uh, yields two different fragments, one fragment which is the constant region, and another fragment which is what we call the FAB2 region. And because this fragment is, is, it doesn't have the constant region, there is no concern that it may cross-react with FC receptors contained in your sample. I think in regards to pepsin, I think the digestion is at this level, this and this, so three different fragments are, are, are yield. One of them is, again, the FC region, and then two, two identical fragments correspond uh, to the variable regions, and they are called FAB fragments. So that, again, is a possibility that you have if you still need to use secondary antibodies in your experiment. So very briefly, to summarize uh, the different factors that need to be considered when choosing between direct versus indirect methods, first of all, time. Uh, obviously, direct methods or primary antibody conjugates result in shorter protocols. protocols. Why? Because less incubation steps. Secondary antibody conjugates, longer protocols. Two incubation steps are at least required when using a secondary antibody conjugate. Cost, the cost of primary antibody conjugates is generally more expensive, even more than uh, unconjugated primary antibodies. Uh, however, secondary antibodies are relatively inexpensive. They are cheaper than primary antibodies, conju unconjugated or conjugated, and they can be used uh, with many different primary antibodies. So that results in additional savings. Complexity. As we mentioned earlier, direct methods are less complex, indirect methods are more complex, more controls required, 
you may need to consider a species cross reactivity that adds complex complexity to the design of your experiment. Flexibility, the methods are less flexible. Your, your primary antibody is already conjugated. You cannot choose what label to use because that's limitation. However, if using a secondary antibody, secondary antibody conjugate because you can use it for many different primary antibodies, you can actually play with that flexibility and, and, and choose the color that best suits your needs or, or the needs of your experiment, of course. Sensitivity, lower for direct methods generally, higher for indirect methods because several secondary antibody conjugates will bind to your primary antibody. A species cross activity, minimized with direct antibodies. You need you basically do need almost do not need to worry about the species cross activity. Of course, there are some exceptions. In indirect methods, there's the potential of a species cross activity, but again, if we're worried about about that and we still need to use a secondary antibody, we can uh, use pre-absorbed secondary antibodies. And, 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 and just to mention, I forgot earlier to mention, the way that you will know whether a secondary is pre absorbed or not, it will, also, it will usually be stated on the title of the product. It can be stated as either pre absorbed or cross absorbed the two, the two terms you, uh, mean the same thing. And, and usually in the data sheet, the, the, the species for which the secondary antibody minimally cross reacts with are stated in the data sheet. In regards to background, reduce for uh, primary antibody conjugates. There's not so much problems for background. However, secondary antibody conjugates are at reagents to your experiment, so the potential background and the potential for background is higher within direct methods. But in the end, it's actually the experimental need what is going to define the most appropriate product to use. So you're going to have to consider whether you're going to, whether you're, whether you're going to use, excuse me, cellular imaging, flow cytometry, or Western blood. You're going to have to consider these different factors. You're going to have to consider the abundance of your target and, 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 and your target, of course, whether it's a membrane protein, whether, whether it's, a, it's a nuclear antigen. All those things need to be considered, and in the end, it's, it's actually that experimental need that is going to define, with, along with all these factors, that is going to define what is best, whether to use a direct method or indirect method. In regards to cellular imaging and flow cytometry, as I was uh, mentioning earlier, so just I think it's, 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 it's good that we go very briefly through those, these two methods. I'm sure that most of you are already familiar with them and, and you use them in a routine basis, but um, they have a great impact on the decision of between a direct method and indirect method, so I thought it would be good just very briefly to go through them. Flow cytometry samples are cells in suspension. Uh, of course, you need them in suspension so they, could, they can get into the uh, flow, the, the, the fluidic system of, of the instrument and, and, and be analyzed and, and, and measured. Cellular imaging, your samples are going to be adherent cells. So you can visualize them under the microscope. In regards to light detection, inflow cytometry is going to be a photomultiplier tube that is going to detect the signal provided by the antibody. However, in cellular imaging, it's going to be yourself uh, determining what, uh, what uh, is and what is not uh, a signal. It's the naked eye. It's your naked eye who is going to determine that. The data. For signal, uh, for flow cytometry, the signal is shown as a statistical data. However, no morphological information is provided by uh, flow cytometry. However, the signal in solar imaging is shown as an image. And, 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 and of course, with the image, it comes a lot of uh, rich morphological information. What, depending on your needs, it, it, it may be what, what the experiment requires. So, of course, you know, there, there are other things like the sample acquisition, for instance, in, in flow cytometry is very rapid. You can analyze from 50 to 4,000 cells per second. However, in cellular imaging, is labor intensive. Now, there are some high throughput screening uh, microscopes that allow you uh, the, the analysis of, of, of um, many samples at the same time as cellular imaging. But if you don't have access to this type of instrument, it's usually quite labor intensive. The throughput Therefore, for flow cytometry is quite 
high. However, the output for cellular imaging, uh, because of this labor intensity, is, is usually low. The quantitation, because uh, you are able to analyze so many cells, cells by flow cytometry, is pretty accurate. However, in cellular imaging, imaging is limited. Again, if, if you have access to one of these high content screening instruments for cellular imaging, uh, they, they do, of course, a much better job in regards to quantitation. But otherwise, it's, it's, it's somehow limited. So if there's, as, as, as you can see, there's clear differences in the two, uh, in the two techniques. It's not that if one is better than the other. It's, it, it's just that you may need to use one or the other depending on on the results you're going after or, or your experimental need. But basically, flow cytometry is a multi-parametric analysis in an objective, rapid, and reproducible manner, while cellular imaging provides special information at the morphological level, not only cellular level, but you're also uh, likely to be able to get morphological information at the tissue level. So, and that, of course, can be a great advantage. But one of the things I wanted to point out is that, generally speaking, flow cytometry is more sensitive than fluorescence microscopy. And of course, because of that sensitivity, it's, it's a great uh, factor to consider when deciding between using a primary antibody conjugate or a secondary antibody conjugate. Now, moving on, let's go very briefly into the relevance to multicolor analysis. Multicolor analysis uh, or multicolor experiments, multiple or experiments involving uh, multi, uh, multiple labels, they allow for the evaluation, of course, as, as the name implies, the evaluation of multiple antigens uh, within a complex tissue. And of course, that can be very helpful. Sometimes it, it, you can obtain more data with less work, so who doesn't want that? And, um, and in, but of course, this has a certain uh, this affects whether choosing uh, a primary conjugate or secondary antibody conjugate. How it affects? Well, basically, we can say that multicolor analysis heightens most factors in influencing that decision. So when it comes to time, if, if using a secondary antibody conjugate, remember that we mentioned that uh, indirect methods usually result in longer protocols. So if doing a multicolor experiment, the time will be even longer, of course. Cost, uh, because um, primary antibody conduits are generally more expensive, uh, the cost will be significantly higher if using primary antibody conduits in a multicolor experiment than secondary antibody conduits. Complexity, complexity is going to be higher for indirect methods in, in multicolor experiments. Uh, and again, that's because you're going to have to take into account more controls. Here, more, even more because uh, you're playing with different colors. So there are many different combinations to take into account, and that adds uh, considerable complexity. You also need to account for uh, species cross-reactivity. So all those things are important uh, to consider in your experiment. Flexibility, well, it's going to be even lower uh, with, uh, direct, uh, with direct methods or, or primary antibody conduits in multicore analysis. Uh, you're going to be limited by the fluorocombs to which or, or enzymes. Uh, to which uh, your primary antibodies are contributed to. So the flexibility is going to be decreased even further in, in multicolor experiments using primary antibody conduits. Sensitivity, well, sensitivity is probably the only factor that is not affected by, uh, by the fact of, using, uh, of, 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 of doing an experiment with a single label or multiple labels. So that remains uh, the same. Sensitivity is usually higher when using secondary antibodies because they will, many of them will bind to the primary antibodies, usually lower uh, with primary antibody conjugates. A species cross-reactivity, of course, you're, you're adding even more reagents to your experiments in that, in that multicolor analysis. So uh, there's more potential for species cross-reactivity. You're going to have to use primary antibodies raised in different species. And of course, there's a chance, there's a higher chance for those secondary antibodies to cross-react with uh, all those other primary antibodies. However, and just to remind you, here you have the possibility of using pre source secondaries that uh, will minimize that potential cross-reactivity. Background, the background, of course, uh, again, similarly to species cross-reactivity, the potential is higher in indirect methods. More reagents are 
uh, add uh, for the potential of, of, of more interactions with uh, non-specific antigens and, of course, resulting in, in, in increased background. So, to summarize, multicore analysis heightens most factors influencing direct and indirect methods. So now, to finalize, I just want to go very briefly through the tools and resources that Alcan as a company is able to offer you to help you in your, uh, in your immunoassays, whether you use a direct or indirect method. There are many different tools and resources that can, that can be very helpful to you. So we provide a highly validated antibody conjugates. We provide both primary and secondary antibody conjugates. <clears throat> These conduits are all, all manufactured or, or are manufactured in our labs and uh, to make sure that they comply with uh, high quality standards um, established by our scientists, our team of scientists with uh, that they of all they all have of course PhD degrees and they have considerable experience so that they establish quite uh, high quality standards uh, to make sure that these uh, these uh, reagents perform well. Uh, in your hands and to make sure that uh, that there are no delays in your experiments. And, and, and as part of those high quality standards, uh, we make sure that each of the reagents is validated in key applications. Among them, uh, we have, of course, immunocytochemistry, uh, like in the example here on the right, but we also have flow cytometry, immunohistochemistry, or fluorescent western blotting. Of course, it will, this will depend on the, on the specific reagent, but we usually provide uh, validation in in the most uh, key applications for the for each of, for each reagent, and all the data generated uh, from validation of the antibody is provided on the data sheet, the supporting data. Uh, so we provide that the images, like the one here, very crisp, uh, very specific. This one specifically is for beta three tubulin conjugated to Alexa four six four seven, and as you can see, it's a very very beautiful image, and, and each of these images is accompanied by detailed methods, uh, so you can reproduce it in your labs. Additionally, we also have references, uh, uh, references from uh, publications in which uh, the uh, antibody um, or the region has been used, and, and of course, we also have independent customer review, so you can uh, see what uh, other colleagues uh, from, from the scientific community think about the performance of, of the product. So, um, as part of our uh, primary antibody conduit offering, uh, many of our primary antibody conduits are based on our RAMAP technology. And, and some of you may be already familiar with this technology. This is our unique rabbit monoclonal antibody technology. It takes advantage of the superior anti antigen recognition of a rabbit. As you know, uh, rabbit polyclonal antibodies uh, have been taking advantage of, of that superior antigen uh, immune system of the rabbit for many years. However, it's been very hard to develop monoclonal antibodies in rabbit. There were certain limitations that we managed to overcome a few years ago, and we developed this fantastic uh, RAMAP technology that allows us uh, to develop monoclonal antibodies in rabbit. So we take advantage on one side of the superior antigen recognition of the rabbit, and at the same time, we provide that uh, that increased specificity and consistency of a monoclonal antibody. And we have combined uh, this technology with Alexa fluor dyes. And as, uh, as you know, these, these dyes have become really popular. Um, they match most common fluorescence dyes used traditionally, such as FITC, erythrin, or APC. And in many cases, Alexa fluor dyes are brighter than the conventional dyes. They also show a greater photostability, so they allow you to, <coughs> excuse me, they allow you for longer image capture times, and the pH insensitivity is also broad over, uh, it's also it's also good over a broad uh, pH range, and of course they also have a good water solubility. So these are are very consistent dyes that uh, perform really well, and, and 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 of course that many of you have probably already use. So we have combined both technologies, our RAMAP technology with Alexa to bring, to bring you an exclusive range of conjugated RAMAP primary antibodies. So this range is exclusive to APCAM, 
We've chosen uh, the targets uh, based, of course, on, on scientific demand, based on, on the needs of your experiments. And, uh, and, and the range is growing considerably. Uh, we've, I believe we have already more than 1,500 uh, primary antibody, RAMAP primary antibody conjugates uh, on our catalog, and, and <clears throat> we're going to publish many more in the coming year, in the coming months. As I mentioned, our RAMAC technology means high affinity because of that superiority of the rabbit immune system. And, and of course, it's a monoclonal antibody. The Alexa drives provide bold and bright images, bold and bright signals. And as I just mentioned, it's a fast growing product. So each of these RAMAC primary antibody contributes is accompanied by uh, beautiful, beautiful images showing um, its quality. In this case, we have a rabbit monoclonal to HM, HMGB1. It's, a, it's a, a nuclear antigen, and you can see a very bright nuclear signal here. And we also provide you an example of how it works in multicolor experiments. In this case, we have acting, I believe, in red color. And of course, we're using DAPI to label the nucleus, and then we're merging all of them to show you the performance of the antibody in a multicolor setting. So each product data sheet contains this high-quality imaginary not only for cellular imaging, but for flow cytometry in many cases as well. And the methodology is detailed for each one of the images, so you can reproduce the data in your own labs. So very briefly, contributed Rama primary antibodies. Uh, Rama antibodies, uh, the benefits, of course, are a higher antibody affinity and specificity for good signal amplification. <clears throat> Alexa fluor dyes, brightest dyes on the market. We also add an additional separation step to remove any unbound dye that results from the conjugation of the antibody. So this ensures a high signal to noise ratio. Many of the antibodies have been validated for both immunocytochemistry and flow cytometry. So uh, we bring, bring you confidence and trust in the performance of the, of the antibody. And we have them in stock uh, across the different offices that we have around the world so you can make sure you receive it in a timely manner. So um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we also have uh, quite a broad range of secondary antibodies conjugated to Alexa fluor dyes. Um, as I was just telling you earlier, these are manufactured in-house, complying with high QC standards. Conjugation, we make sure that an optimal number of fluorescent molecules uh, per antibody is achieved. And purification, we have that additional step to remove free dye resulting from the conjugation to ensure a high sensitivity. We've also optimized the formulation for optimal performance and shelf life, and they're extensively validated. Each of our secondary antibodies contributed to Alexa fluor dyes uh, in flow cytometry, immunocytochemistry, and fluorescent western blood if applicable. And all this data is provided on the data sheets with uh, extensive product information and, and detailed methodology, bringing, bringing you trust and, and credibility on the performance on the, of the product. Um, our, our range of Alexa, uh, Alexa fluor secondaries is ideal for multicolor uh, analysis. We currently offer secondary antibodies conjugated to, different, to nine different Alexa fluor dyes that cover the whole spectrum with minimal spectral overlap and they can be used with most common lasers. Also, uh, the, of course, this broad range uh, of secondaries is meant to target a, a diverse set of species and their isotypes to make sure that uh, you find the antibody, the secondary antibody that you need. Some of them has been raised in different species, including donkey, goat, and rabbit. So you can play with this depending on, on the needs for your multicolor experiment. And a large selection of these antibodies are pre-absorbed, uh, so you don't have to worry about the species cross activity in those multicolor or multiple labeling experiments. But in case uh, we, don't, we unfortunately don't have uh, your uh, primary antibody of interest already conjugated, we also offer a large range of antibody conjugation kits. They allow you to easily add the label you need to your antibody in a quickly manner uh, for hours standard. However, we also uh, have some fast conjugation kits that allow you to do it in less than 20 minutes, which is quite convenient, very, very fast labeling of your antibody. 
the, as I mentioned, it can be done easily. It's a simple protocol, and enhanced time is actually only 30 seconds. And the important, of course, thing here is, is the antibody recovery, which is 100% with our uh, antibody conjugation kits. And, and you can use from 10 micrograms to 2 milligrams or antibody in, in your conjugation. So you can make sure that you don't lose any <clears throat> amount of your primary antibody during the process. And our range includes a, a large uh, diversity of fluorescent dyes, such as FITSI, cyanines. We also have dye-light dyes, all, type, uh, all different types of dyes, but we also uh, some fluorescent proteins, proteins, such as phycoerythrin, and also some tandem dyes, which are sometimes very useful for flow cytometry, such as PERCP and CY5.5. <clears throat> In regards to resources, we have a stellar imaging guide. Uh, it contains a lot of tips uh, and protocols for your cellular imaging experiments. And then, and then there are also, of course, some products highlighted there that we believe uh, will, add will add significant value to your experiments, ensuring performance uh, and, 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 and optimization uh, won't be required as much with these type of products. Uh, 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 of course, the, the conjugated primary and secondary antibodies and some kits are uh, relevant to several imaging. And we also have a, a, a very nice fluorocom chart. It's a comprehensive guide uh, to, fluorocom, to fluorocom selection. So uh, in, in the fluorocom chart, you will find the steps to follow to make sure you select uh, the appropriate antibody for the appropriate fluorocom for your experiment. Uh, we've uh, selected 30 of the most popular fluorocoms, and we provide emission and excitation spectra, lasers, filters, and brightness uh, for this for this program. So please go to our website, appcom.com, and check it out because uh, both resources are, are very useful. So thank you very much for your attention. And, um, and, and well, we'll go ahead with the Q&A session. So I'll hand it over to Jessica so, so we can go ahead with your questions. Thank you. So we have a few questions here. So let's see, the first question is, can conjugation of the primary antibody affect its performance? So that's, that's a good point. Um, yes, it can affect, of course, conjugation of the primary antibody can affect, in some cases, the performance of, of the antibody. And <clears throat> however, for our line of RAMAP antibody conjugators, as, as I've mentioned earlier, we validate each one of them in different applications. They're, they comply each one of them with high QC standards established by our team of scientists. So we, we make sure that you don't have to worry about that, uh, that problem with, uh, that potential problem with performance of the antibody when contributed to, uh, to, to different, different molecules. So you can be certain that uh, if choosing one of our RAMAP antibody contributes, you won't have to worry about the performance. If having to rely on an antibody contribution kit, uh, normally, these, uh, these, uh, our conjugation kits, they, are, uh, they, 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 they have been designed so the conjugation um, is done to the groups that are less likely to affect the performance of the antibody. So there's, there's a very low probability of, of the performance of, of the conjugation of the antibody affecting its performance if, you, if, its performance if using one of our uh, conjugation kits. I hope that answers your question. Um, there's, there's a second question here uh, which reads, is it possible to use primary antibodies raised in the same species in multicolor experiments? All right, so yeah, I think, of course, this is a problem that many people um, um, come across. And um, so, of course, my, my first recommendation is, is to try, try to stay away from, of course, using uh, primary antibodies raised in the same species in a multicolor experiment um, if, if, if having to use secondary antibodies. Of course, so first there is the consideration if you're using an antibody, a primary antibody conjugate, uh, it really doesn't matter uh, the species in which the antibody has been raised in regards to, in regards to species cross-reactivity um, because uh, it's already conjugated. So, so that's uh, less problems for you if you're using anti uh, a primary antibody country. However, if you need to use a secondary antibody, um, that's something you need to account for. Um, and, for and, and if you need to use a secondary antibody, then what I would recommend uh, 
The first and foremost is, is using primary antibodies raised in different species. Um, however, if, if, it's, if you think you need to use a primary antibody or primary antibodies raised in the same species, you might be able uh, to use them as long as their isotypes are different. So for instance, let's say, and, and even more if they are subclass different. So for instance, uh, um, let's say that one of your primary antibodies is the isotype of your first primary antibody is IgG2A, and then the isotype of, your, of another primary antibody is, is IgG3. We have uh, a secondary antibodies that specifically detect IgG3 or IgG2A, and they do not detect other subclasses or, or isotypes. And, so, and you might be able to use those secondary antibodies to detect uh, both primary antibodies in, in a multi, uh, multi, uh, multiple labeling experiment. But, but as you can already see, it, it's quite limited, your, your, um, your possibilities there. Um, you have also the possibility of using biotinylated secondaries and using fragment secondaries to get away with it. There, there are certain combinations that you can do. Um, so, uh, uh, so, yeah, you can definitely explore, explore those um, if, if really needed. Okay, so let's go ahead with another, um, with another question. So we have a third question. How can I know whether my secondary antibody is Piatrov? Sorry, so, so yeah, um, as I was mentioning uh, earlier during the webinar, um, so preabsorption is usually stated in the name, in the product name. Uh, so you will have, for instance, go enter rabbit IgG HNL Alexa 448 preabsorb. So if you find preabsorb or, or, or crossabsorb, uh, both terms are used equ uh, are used uh, to mean the same thing. That means that the antibody has been preabsorb. If you want to know the species that uh, against the antibody has been preabsorbed to. Um, you have to go into the data sheet, they're normally stated there. We have another question. Uh, what should we consider while selecting fluorophores? So that, that's a very good question. And I, I recommend you to go uh, to our fluorocom chart. Uh, the fluor that fluorocom chart uh, provides a guide uh, of, the, of the, the steps that you need to follow when selecting a fluorochrome. But very briefly, uh, first thing, uh, the first thing, of course, is uh, the abundance of your antigen. Well, sorry, I, I, should, I should say the first thing is your instrument. So your instrument will define what fluorochromes you can or you cannot use. Uh, that they're, uh, that depending on the lasers and the filters that are equipped in your instrument, uh, you may be able to use some one or other fluorophores. And, um, and our fluorochrome chart is equipped with uh, common lasers and common filters to help you know uh, what fluorophores are available to you. Uh, so once, once you know that, then uh, you have to consider, of course, uh, two things. One, one side, you have to consider the abundance of your antigen. Uh, and, and why is that? Uh, the reason being is that uh, there are some fluorophores that are brighter than others. Uh, so of course, if, if you are only uh, looking at one antigen and you're using one antibody, uh, I, I, of course, I would recommend using for, going for uh, for Alexa Fluor 4A8 or FITSI because uh, most instruments, if not all, are equipped with a blue laser for detection of, of that fluorophore and because it's a very bright fluorophore. However, if you need to uh, look at several antigens, then you will need to consider the expression of the antigen because you're going to want to use the brighter fluorophore with uh, your antigen express express in lower abundance. And, and of course, your, your less bright fluorophore with uh, the highly expressed antigen. Let's say that uh, you want to look at actin and, uh, and Ki67. Um, so Ki67, it, it, it's only a few cells will express Ki67, and, and, but all the cells will, have, will express actin and, and in high amounts. And, and you want to use, for instance, I don't know, uh, let's say, I think, uh, a good, a good uh, combination would be 408 and um, and maybe 647. Um, so um, or, or or let's say maybe more drastic, uh, uh, 405, 405 and 647. So 647 is definitely brighter than 405. So you would want to use uh, 647 for the less abundant 
target, in this case, KA67 and 405 for the a higher abundant tax uh, antigen, uh, in this case, actin. So um, I have a couple of more questions in here. So I have primary antibody with isotype IgG2, but unable to find second antibody having IgG2. Then in this case, which second antibody should we consider? So in this case, uh, you can consider a second antibody that is meant to detect the heavy and light chains of IgG in general. So that's the most common secondary, and, uh, and, and you can go uh, and use any, uh, for instance, a goat anti-rabbit IgG HNL. So usually, secondaries detecting the heavy and light chains are usually, <coughs> um, they're usually, uh, the, the product name usually states HNL, which of course stands for heavy and light chains. And, and it will detect IgG2 to IgG2 because um, the, the different IgG subclasses, they share the light chains. So the difference between this isotype and subclasses is actually the heavy chain. What remains the same is the light chain. And because you're going to use a polyclonal antibody, secondary antibody, detecting both the heavy and light chains, you're going to be able to detect your primary antibody with IgG2 isotype. We have another question. Um, can I use primary and secondary antibody conjugates in the same experiment? Yes, <clears throat> uh, you can use them, but of course, um, if, if, if using a primary antibody conjugate, I will try to stick to primary antibody conjugates because basically, if you're using, uh, uh, if you if you combine them, you're you're basically missing on, on most of the benefits of of using a primary antibody conjugate, which is a shorter protocol time. And, and, and lower uh, complexity, complexity. You don't have to worry about the species cross-activity or, or, or background. So uh, yes, you can use them, but uh, I, would, uh, um, I would certainly recommend not to, if possible, because then you're just kind of missing the benefits of, of primary antibody conjugates. Um, so we have another question. How does clonality of the antibody affect uh, the different factors that uh, that we went through. Um, so, so yes, um, how clonality affects. So that's that's a very uh, important, of course, factor to consider clonality. Whether the the, the antibody is monoclonal or polyclonal, polyclonal has, of course, uh, impact on 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 whether choosing a primary antibody conjugate or a secondary antibody conjugate. Basically. Uh, a polyclonal antibody will, of course, um, um, react with many different epitopes of, of, of the, 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 the antigen, or, or if it's secondary antibody, the primary antibody. If using a monoclonal antibody, uh, only one epitope will be recognized in either the antigen or, or the primary antibody. And, and of course, you know, if, if you have an antibody that reacts that reacts with different epitopes, um, you are going to end up with several antibodies reacting with either the antigen or the primary antibody, resulting in um, in, in a, uh, an additional and increased signal amplification. Um, so um, I, I, I should mention that there are some secondary antibodies that are monoclonal antibodies, and of course, uh, these secondary antibodies will only react with an epitope in the primary antibody. And, and that signal amplification that I mentioned earlier of, of resulting from the interaction of several secondary antibodies with the primary antibody uh, won't happen if using a monoclonal secondary antibody. So that's, that's a good point. Um, you should definitely consider the polyclonality the clonality of your antibody. So um, yes, I think, I think uh, we don't have any more questions. Um, again, thank you very much for your attention. It was uh, my pleasure to talk about this topic, um, and I'll hand it over back to Jessica. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.